Well, good morning. It's great to see you in worship today. Would you stand together and hear these words from Psalm 117 as we begin our service, the shortest psalm in the Bible. And yet uh, the song we're going to sing this morning is based on this one. Praise the Lord, all nations. Glorify him, all peoples. For his faithful love to us is great. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Hallelujah. And uh, that word, glorify him, and some has been translated uh, with loud shout or exclamation or a roar of praise. And that's what we're going to do together. I want to hear you roar in <laughs> praise. From the earth to the sky, let it rise, let it rise. From the dark into light, now alive, now alive. We are here to lift you up, here to sing a song of love, here to give you, God, what you are worthy of. Oh, in this place. Amen. Morning, church family. So good to see you here today. If you are visiting with us today for the very first time, I would love to just connect with you and want to let you know about our connection card. You can find it online at fbcmail.info slash connect. And you can just fill out as much of that as you're comfortable with. Just helps us to get to know you, maybe answer any questions you might have about uh, our church. There's also a place on that card just to let us know any prayer needs that you have that we can be praying for you about um, this upcoming week. And so before you sit down, though, we're not doing our traditional handshake greeting time uh, with everything going on. But uh, before you sit down, just turn around, give a wave to somebody, say good morning to somebody before you take your seat today. (laughs) 
All right, and as you are seated, I want to invite two special families to join me on the platform. I want to invite the Smith family to come and the Malden family to come and join me here. And church family, you welcome them as they come this morning. And today is such a special day in the life of our church. We're able to recognize two of our pastors who have uh, served here uh, for such a long duration. Uh, Pastor Doug Malden, this, uh, this month represents 25 years since Pastor Doug came to our church. And uh, when he first came, you, you can see what he looked like when I first met Doug. You see the 1996 picture? That's mullet Doug right there. <laughs> And uh, he was uh, my youth pastor, came to the church when I was in ninth grade, had a huge impact on my life. My wife, uh, Megan, uh, came to know Christ under Doug's uh, ministry. So many folks have, have come to know the Lord, have been called into ministry uh, under Doug and, and Kim and their years here. 18 years as our student pastor. The last seven years, he served as our community and family life pastor. Does an amazing job in everything that that, that entails and a lot of different hats uh, that Pastor Doug wears. And so thankful for you guys. And then uh, also... Uh, uh, Pastor Dennis here, he came 20 years ago this month. And uh, in church family, I hope you know how rare that is to have multiple pastors on your staff who, who come and stay for a long time, 20 and 25 years just with these two. And came the very same month, I believe, we transitioned here from our downtown location to this Dairy Road location. Doug had a few years at the old, uh, old church downtown. Uh, but has been here during these 20 years, seeing the Lord do some amazing things over these past 20 years. Uh, Pastor Dennis oversees uh, all of our uh, disciple-making small groups, which has grown to nearly 60 groups that are under uh, Dennis's care. Uh, he really just has a heart for discipleship. And so when I see our church and the culture of discipleship that is here, uh, really I trace a lot of that back to Pastor Dennis, his love to make disciples who make disciples. Also, of course, loves on our seniors, has several stints of, of leading our senior ministry, and uh, so thankful for you, Dennis, and just your godliness, your love for Jesus. And, uh, and also, of course, over these 20 and 25 years, we've just gotten to know their families. We've seen their kids grow up. Uh, how old were, were your two when, when y'all moved here? Three and five years old, all right, when they moved here, and then now grown, married, children. We even have a couple pastoral grandkids that we de dedicated one last week uh, as uh, Pastor Doug's uh, daughter has married one of Pastor Dennis's sons. So there's there an intermarriage here going on. Yes, you know, when you stay that long at a church, that stuff starts to happen here. And, uh, and so, so thankful for all of you guys and, and for your families. Have a, a gift we wanted to give you first, just a, a gift of thanks from, from our church family to you guys. And, uh, and then also a book of letters and pictures that our church family has sent in for you guys just to commemorate um, your time here. And I love that Brother Larry is able to be here to help present this because Brother Larry was the pastor who called both of these brothers to our church to serve in our staff. And so as you look behind, you see those pictures of, of uh, these years that have gone by, years of faithfulness, serving the Lord, and we pray for the years to come as well. And so church family, let's pray for these two men and for their families together. Father, we thank you for Pastor Doug and Pastor Dennis. And uh, Lord, just for their love for you, thank you for calling them to our church, uh, Father, 25 and 20 years ago this month. Uh, thank you for the ministry that you have given them here. Thank you for the lives that have been changed because of their ministry. Thank you for their wives. Thank you for their families, their grandchildren now that are joining them on the stage. Uh, Father, just evidence of your blessing, uh, evidence of your grace upon these men. And uh, we pray for the years to come, Lord, that you would continue to use them, that, Father, they would find favor in whatever they set their hand to do, and you would use them in great ways for your glory and for your kingdom. And as a church family, we thank you for them today, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. 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 Let's celebrate once more with <laughs> Pastor Dennis, Pastor Doug today. Love you guys. And again, so thankful to have uh, Brother Larry here as a part of this recognition time. Uh, also thankful as uh, I was with my family this uh, entire past week uh, on vacation. Of course, didn't want to miss this special time of recognition this morning. But I've asked uh, Brother Larry to come and to bring uh, God's word to us. You know, we just uh, talked about a longevity of ministry, what God can do when you stay in one place for a long time. Pastor Larry is another wonderful example of that, of having served as our senior pastor of our church for 25 years. He came to our church in 1986 and served the Lord here faithfully through 2011. 
until the Lord led him to a ministry, started a ministry called Sent, equipping the church. He travels uh, around the world. Whenever you don't see him here on a Sunday morning, it's probably because he's somewhere on the other side of the world training pastors for the kingdom and for the sake of the gospel. And so after we uh, worship a bit more, uh, Brother Larry, we look forward to hearing you as you bring God's word to us today.
What are you pursuing in life? Are you pursuing holiness and righteousness? Are you chasing after the things of God? Or are you being wooed by the world, pulled in directions of earthly things? Our desire is that our hope and our focus would be on Christ and on Him alone. Rather than the sins that so easily entangle us and so many things in the world to reach out and grab us. But rather that we would pursue holiness, righteousness, faith, integrity, godly character. We're going to hear in the message today about a couple of folks who got that wrong. I pray that for us in this room right now, we can say, God, we want to pursue you and your son, Jesus Christ, with all that we have. Let's stand and sing that commitment together. You're my constant in the chaos. You're my compass when the road is long. You're my portion never.
Well, it's good to be with you this morning. Thank you, Pastor Scott, for giving me this privilege to preach, and especially on this Sunday when we honor Dennis and Doug. Uh, they've been a great part of my life and uh, two of the best decisions we ever made as a church when we called them to serve with us uh, those many years ago. Uh, they've been friends and co-laborers and uh, have been such a, uh, their wisdom and their passion for the Lord Jesus Christ has been such a uh, great part of my life and the life of our church. I also want to say thank you to the church for uh, your prayers for Gail and me as we were in South Asia for almost three months. We were intended to be there for four months, but because of the uh, virus, we came home early. But uh, your prayers opened many doors for us uh, in that uh, slum area where we were working, and uh, we saw uh, about 100 people come to know Christ. We saw about four or five disciple groups formed, and many were just at the point of baptism when things were shut down. Uh, but we had such a great experience. We we're praying and thinking about going back again next year, if, if the Lord wills, and this virus uh, abates somewhat. But uh, we're glad you're here today. And uh, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I was told to say that as part of the introduction, uh, open them to Acts chapter 4, if you would, and hold it there for just a moment. When I was a kid, about seven or eight, my dad was my pastor at the time, and we only had uh, four of us children. Uh, I was the second oldest. I had three sisters. And uh, we often, uh, since we were in the church all the time, one of the games we played was church. I had a bed that had drawers that you could pull out under the mattress, and we'd take out one of those and turn it upside uh, down, and it became the pulpit. And uh, I was the preacher. That's when I started preaching, uh, when I was seven or eight. And uh, my sisters were the congregation. They weren't very happy about it, but uh, they were. And it's all right uh, and innocent, I think, for children to play church, but when we grow up, it's something else to play church. It's become a very dangerous thing. When we left the church in, in Acts last week, uh, the, the uh, leadership had come back from a meeting with the Sanhedrin being warned not to speak in the name of Jesus. And uh, what they did when they came back was not to uh, shudder and fear and uh, say, oh, we got to pull back and all. No, they prayed for boldness to speak the word of God with boldness. And uh, they did that. And uh, we find out that uh, God was working and what Satan, the roaring lion, had been unable to do through outside through persecution, now the slippery serpent, Satan, comes in to deceive the church from inside. And uh, this section should really uh, have been included in one piece without a chapter division. Those came much later. But the end of chapter 4 and the first paragraph of chapter 5 go together. And uh, we find, uh, and I want to read the text at this time. So if you have your Bibles, you follow along with me, beginning in chapter 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and they laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this saying in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. And it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter had answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes. 
for so much. And then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all those who heard these things. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word and how it speaks to us even today. Thank you, Lord, for this story as a reminder that you long for us to be a genuine, true church. And uh, Lord, that uh, we should give up our mask and our hypocrisy uh, to become all that you want us to be. I pray now that your spirit would take these words and apply them to our hearts and our lives. And we give you this time and praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at this story, uh, as, as we had uh, read, read in chapter 4, the vibrant actions of the real church, and particularly of one disciple named Barnabas, chapter 5 begins with the word but. And whenever that word but is there in the Bible, you ought to take notice. Someone has said, the buts in the Bible are the hinges on which great doors swing. They always mark a decisive change in the story. And this is especially true here as we see a contrast between the real vibrant church in Acts 4 with the actions of the hypocrites, Ananias and Sapphira. And uh, have you noticed that God in his word often puts two people of totally different character together uh, to demonstrate his right way and his wrong way? And uh, for instance, the very first children in the Bible, Cain and Abel, are put next together. And we see the contrast in their lifestyles. We see the difference between Abraham and his nephew Lot, between Esau and his brother Jacob, between King Saul and King David. And here we see this contrast very vividly uh, between the live church, the, the growing church, and the hypocrisy of these two. And so today I want to uh, look, first of all, the example of this vibrant, real, genuine church as contrasted with Ananias and Sapphira. And look first at the real and genuine church. Several things are said about them in general. He begins by talking about how they were uh, meeting uh, in unity. He said they were with one heart and one soul. Another expression in the book of Acts is they met in one accord. Now, this was not referring to a Honda product, but talking about their unity, their being together and having the same purpose, the same goals and desires. They were fulfilling the prayer of Jesus in John 17, where he prayed that my church might be one, even as you, Father, and I are one. And the unity was very evident in that early church. And I don't know uh, about you, but we are so blessed in our church here at uh, First Baptist Church Melbourne to have that kind of unity and harmony. If you've ever been a part of a church that was split, a church that was always fighting with one another, you can appreciate what we have uh, here in our church. And we're blessed with staff and with members and leadership who work together in that common goal. And he talks about they had all things in common. Uh, the Greek word here is koinonia, and it's a very special word throughout the New Testament sometimes translated by many different English words. He talks about having things in common. Yeah, the word fellowship is often used. The word uh, partnership or partakers all describe this same idea of having things in common. And G. Campbell Morgan says on this common fellowship, the great teaching of the New Testament is that the child of God has fellowship with God. That is all things in common with God. All the resources of God are at the disposal of the child of God, and all the resources of the child of God are at the disposal of God. These men of the early Christians, therefore, had all things in common with each other. And so much that they would uh, take uh, of their surplus and uh, sell it, or give it away to the church, to the apostles, uh, in order to take care of the needs of those who did not have. And he said, well, that's, that's communism. No, <laughs> this was something that was voluntary. It was not forced upon them as communism exists today. But it was something they did because they wanted to help those in need. And notice also it says they had great power. 
demonstrated by the power of the resurrection and their sharing that good news that had transformed their lives from being afraid and frightened of the, the religious leaders who had crucified their Savior. When they uh, realized that Jesus was alive, the resurrection was real, it transformed their life. It made them uh, active in sharing their faith regardless of the cost, with no fear as uh, they lived out their lives for him. Such boldness. And it says great grace was upon them. Not only great power, but great grace. This described the beauty, the glory evident in their character. Uh, they were different. They were like Peter and John as seen by the Sanhedrin in chapter 4. They took notice that what? They had been with Jesus. And folks, when we uh, have uh, that intimacy with Jesus Christ, when we know him in that kind of way, there is a great grace that just uh, covers our life so that it's evident to, to the world around us that we have been with Jesus. And uh, this is the general example of the church, but also we have insight into a particular example of one man, uh, a Levite from Cyprus, who was named Joseph, who sold a piece of property and laid all the money at the feet of the apostles to help the poor. And uh, Joseph, uh, first of all, I say a Levite was not supposed to own property in Israel, but maybe because he was living in Cyprus, he could have property. But he sold his property, and so much it affected the church that they changed his name from Joseph to Barnabas. And we'll see Barnabas crop up in Acts about 25 times his name is mentioned. Very familiar with him. Uh, but his name means son of encouragement or son of consolation. It's the same word that's used of the Holy Spirit. He is our paracleate. He is the one who stands along beside us. He is the encourager and exhorter in our life. And we see this evident in Barnabas' life so many times. I mean, not long after this, uh, Paul is saved on the road to Damascus. And you remember, uh, he is transformed for the chief persecutor of the church to one who becomes one of the great spokesmen for the church. And he immediately started preaching. He went to Jerusalem, and at first the church in Jerusalem was hesitant to accept him into their midst. They thought he might be part of a sting operation, <laughs> You know, and everybody was leery of him. However, Barnabas steps up and said, no, this is genuine. This is real. God has done a work in his life. We need to accept him. And so much later that when the church expanded to the Gentile city of Antioch and it began to grow and mushroom, the disciples or the apostles sent Barnabas there to pastor that church. It kept growing. He needed help. And he called Paul to be his assistant. He was an encourager. Later on, when uh, they went on their first missionary journey, came back, and uh, Paul suggested, hey, let's go back to all these mission uh, points that we started. And uh, Barnabas said, well, that's, that's a great idea, but let's take John Mark with us. Paul says, no way. You know, John Mark went with us the first time. He turned around and went home after just a short time. He's a mama's boy. He's a quitter. You know, he doesn't deserve to be with us on a mission trip. And Barnabas kept on saying, no, no, he's, he, we need to give him a second chance. And, you know, had Barnabas not encouraged John Mark, we might not have had one of the four Gospels that we have, the Gospel of Mark. So he was an encourager. And, you know, I and you, we need to learn from Barnabas about encouraging one another. I don't know about you, but I need encouragement a lot. And you do, too. I remember when I was in high school and college, when I first went to college, uh, we had a practice. We thought it was real cool to cut down people, you know, to say kind of uh, cutting remarks just to put them in their place. Uh, when I was in high school, I was very skinny. You wouldn't believe it now, but I was uh, 6'3 and 145. I was a string beam, and people used to cut me. You say, he's so skinny, he sticks out his tongue, he looks like a zipper. Or, or his pajamas only have one stripe, his stripe of pajamas, one stripe, you know, and things like that, and I would get back at them. I would use uh, whatever wit I had. I really was a half wit, but anyway, I shared what I had, and, and you know, and I would cut somebody down, and, and we got to a place in college where we confessed, that, hey, we need to stop doing this. This is destructive, but you know, every once in a while, it comes up in my life again, and uh, I, I remember one time when I said something about someone, and one of my Christian brothers called me on it. He said, Larry, when the Holy Spirit gave out his gifts, he missed you on this gift of encouragement, <laughs> and he was right. 
it's something I've had to grow and learn and develop uh, through the years. Uh, when I was a pastor, one of my goals uh, was that every week I would write three letters of encouragement or thanks to people in our church. I didn't do it every week, but uh, I, I, I tried to do it, and it was to develop this gift because I know we all need encouragement. Amen? We need that. And, you know, a, a day should not go by that we should not say that or encourage somebody. Uh, one of my heroes in the New Testament is a friend of Paul called Onesiphorus. If we'd had another son, that's what I wanted to name him. I, I don't think Gail would have been on board with that. But uh, he is mentioned as one who visited Paul often in prison. And uh, he said, he has off refreshed me. And I have a sermon called God's Refreshment Committee, using Onesiphorus as an example, uh, because he refreshed those around him. And uh, he was like a breath of fresh, cool air on a summer's day on somebody's life. And we need to be like Onesiphorus, like Barnabas, and uh, everybody ought to be part of that committee, right? Uh, the Encouragement Refreshment Committee. And so we see uh, a particular example in Barnabas, uh, the real, the genuine. But then we turn to that but. <laughs> and the second half, we look at the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira. You know, the number one accusation against the church today is that they're a bunch of Hypocrites, a bunch of hypocrites. The word is a, it comes from a Greek word, hypocrites, which it refers to someone who wears a mask uh, in, a, in a drama, a Greek drama. For a different character, they would wear a mask. And so it came, hypocrisy came to mean someone who wears a mask. Now I'm looking out at some of you and you've got masks on. That doesn't mean you're a hypocrite. It means you're smart probably uh, than the rest of us. But uh, he talks about the mask wearers. Uh, when we all play the hypocrite at times. You have, I have. You know, when we uh, buy things we do not need with money we do not have to impress people we do not like, <laughs> we're hypocrites, you know. Uh, when we offer flattering remarks to someone that we don't mean and they're not true anyway, we show hypocrisy. Uh, when we come to church on Sunday and we sing loudly the songs of praise and uh, we give our smiles out to everybody around us. But then we leave this place and the rest of the week we act like God doesn't exist. We are hypocrites. And uh, we recognize that Jesus gave his most stinging indictment not to the prostitutes and to the tax collectors, but to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes. And uh, he called them a bunch of hypocrites because they said, said their mouth is for me, but their heart is far away from me. It's impure. And uh, they were filled with judgmental attitudes and with pride. And so he condemned them. And so we're introduced to Ananias and Sapphira, a couple in the church. And I believe it's no accident that these stories are linked together because Barnabas had done his gift and he had received praise and accolades from the church. Oh, did you hear what Barnabas did? Oh, wasn't it great that he sacrificed so much? And I think they thought to themselves, hey, we, we want to get in on some of that praise, some of that glory, some of that recognition. And so let's sell some property and let's say, you know, and while they had the property, it was okay to sell it or not. It was okay to give a portion of what they sold. However, they sold the piece of property and said, we have given the whole amount to the Lord when they only gave a portion of the, the, the price to him. And uh, as Ananias, first of all, comes to Peter, offering the gift, Peter is spirit-filled, and he has been given a spirit of discernment. He knows what's going on, and his response in verse 3 and 4, he says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not your own under your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. Now, in that statement, there's a theological truth here that the Holy Spirit and God are one and the same. You've lied to the Holy Spirit first. He said you've lied to God. And so he equates them together. They're one. And 
he doesn't pronounce a curse on them, said, you're going to die for this or cast a spell on them. You know, Ananias is just brought under conviction by God and, and he gives up the ghost. He dies. He stops breathing, falls dead. And they immediately uh, come to him and take him away and, and bury him. Uh, when, when Scott asked me to preach this message, he uh, said, when I was working back in November on a series titles and all this, I, I came up with a title, The Church Service When People Died. But we both thought that with the COVID-19, this was not a good time to use that title. Uh, so we changed it, or I changed it. And, uh, but it says that uh, great fear came on the church when they carried him out. They buried him. A few hours later, here comes his wife, Sapphira. And, uh, you know, she doesn't know what's happened. Now, it seems strange to us that, uh, uh, number one, that they would bury someone so quickly. And number two, that the wife wasn't present for the burial service. That would be unheard of for us. But back then, uh, before they had uh, some of the, the methods of preserving the body a little while, uh, they had to, to bury them immediately. And she was unaware of what had happened. She, she comes in, and, and uh, she doesn't notice the stares of the people in the church looking at her kind of oddly. Uh, she's unaware of what's going on. And, and uh, so Peter confronts her, says, hey, look in verse uh, 9 and 10. says, uh, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Bang. She falls dead. And uh, they carry her out and bury her next to her husband. And I think it's significant. Verse 11 says, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Duh. You would think great fear would come on the church when something like that happened. And it'd be like in the middle of our offering time one Sunday morning, all of a sudden somebody falls dead over here and somebody falls dead over here. There would be great fear in our church, right, if something like that happened. And, uh, and so it was for them uh, as well. And, you know, my first reaction when I first heard this story was say, wow. And it seems pretty harsh treatment for God to strike somebody dead just for that, for, for not giving all their offering. And, uh, you know, uh, I, the next question is, why isn't God doing it today in our services? You know, does God still hate hypocrisy today? And, and I believe the answer to that is yes. You know, why, why doesn't he deal so harshly with us? So let me just share a few reasons why I think God dealt harshly with them for their hypocrisy. Number one is that hypocrisy interrupted the victorious progress of the church. At the time, you remember from Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved and added to the church of 120 in one day. Just a few weeks later, after Peter and John had healed the man, the lame man at the gate, uh, beautiful, he preached a message, another 2,000 were added to the church. The, the disciples brought before the Sanhedrin and very boldly said, hey, we ought to obey God rather than men. We're not going to stop talking about him. We're going to keep proclaiming him. And uh, they prayed for boldness to speak the word of God with power. Uh, they went out and they began to share their goods, selling their property and giving to help the poor all around them. And uh, things were just going gung-ho for the church. And then this happens. And uh, we find that they are uh, facing something very important, the potential to shut down the growth, the progress of the church, not from outside from persecution, but from inside through this hypocrisy. It reminds me of the story of the children of Israel when they entered the promised land. You remember the first obstacle they faced was, was uh, Jericho. And uh, that dramatic thing of circling the city seven times and then shouting and the walls came tumbling down. <clears throat> they were in the height of victory and they left there. And uh, the next city along the way was a little community called Ai. Ai. It was about that small. In fact, some of the scouts who went and looked at it said, hey, you know, this is a small city. We, we don't need to take the whole army. Just give us about 3,000 soldiers. We'll take care of those guys. And so they went out. And the people in Ai chased after them, and 38 soldiers were, or 36 soldiers were killed. 
And uh, they came back to Joshua, fell down on their faces and said, what has God done to us? He's led us from Egypt to face our destruction here in the promised land. And God had Joshua, get up. Why are you on your face? The reason this has happened because there's sin in the camp. And they did a uh, casting lots and found out there was a man named Achan who had gone in and done exactly what God said not to do. He, God had told them to destroy everything, take no spoils, but he had taken a Babylonian garment and a wedge of gold or silver, and he had taken them to his hint, tent and hid them in the tent. And uh, his family, I believe, were complicit in what had happened. They knew what had happened. They didn't say anything. They said, we're going to be rich when we get to the promised land. And yet, when they were called before Joshua, Joshua had the command from God to stone them to death, the whole family. And uh, this was drastic action because of the greed and the disobedience of God's people at the very beginning of their walk with God in the new land. And in the same way, God deals with Ananias and Sapphira in the same way. What, what might have happened if this hypocrisy was not discovered? You know, people might look at Ananias and Sapphira and say, man, this is a great example. We're having deacon nomination next week. Let's just nominate Ananias to be a deacon or maybe treasurer of the church. And they would have become part of the leadership and, and the community, knowing what had happened, could have pointed the finger. So they're just a bunch of hypocrites. And the power and the purity of the other church would have been compromised. The victorious progress would have been shut down. And, and I wonder, you know, the question comes to me today, why are we not as effective as the early church? Why do we not experience the power of the early church? Could it be that we are guilty of the sin of hypocrisy and that has shut down the flow of God's power in our own personal lives and in the life of our church? And as we think of uh, another reason why God dealt with them so harshly, he recognizes that hypocr hypocrites are in the hands of Satan. Hypocrites are in the hands of Satan. He says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? The origin of hypocrisy is straight from the heart of Satan, the enemy of God, the father of liars. And I believe that Satan whispered the lie in the ears of this couple saying, hey, you want to be recognized like, like Barnabas? Uh, you want people to think you're as spiritual as, as Barnabas? Here's how you can do it. And, and Satan wants to encourage us to wear our mask and uh, not be real with people. He says, people are not going to accept you if they know what you're really like, you know, if they knew the real you. And, and Satan is into secretness. He's into darkness. He's into deceit where Jesus is into openness, light, and authenticity. And see, the third thing, hypocrisy destroys intimacy with God. Peter reminds us that uh, they had lied to God. And God not only sees our actions, but he can look into our heart. He knows our motives. He knows our thoughts. And he knew exactly what was going on with Ananias and Sapphira. And it's impossible for us to worship God and wear the mask of hypocrisy. Jesus reminds us in John 4, 24, that God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in what? Truth, in truth. And uh, God took such tra uh, drastic action because he places this high value on intimacy with him. And our sin of hypocrisy prevents that intimacy. Now, let me ask you a question. Does God still desire intimacy with you and me? Yes, he does. He wants us to, to walk with him and talk with him on a daily basis. And it's impossible to do that when we're living as a hypocrite. So how do we counteract hypocrisy? Let me just mention from 1 John chapter 5, or 1, 1 John 1, beginning in verse 5, he says, this is the message which we had heard from him, and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And so the first thing is we need to walk in the light as he's in the light. You see, Satan wants us to walk in secret. That's why so much sin is done under the cover of darkness. We, we want to hide from others. Uh, they, they won't see me. 
But he says, we need to walk in light as he is in the light. And then he goes on to say that, uh, uh, that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. He says, we have fellowship with one another. And again, the lie of Satan is you got to do it by yourself. You don't need to let anybody else know what's going on in your life. And that's why it's so important, as Dennis and Doug have been so good about small groups, you know, we need one another. You know, Satan wants to uh, have us separate. He wants us to isolate. But God wants us to come together and confess our faults to one another and to encourage one another. And we can do that with small groups or at least a small accountability group. Uh, we need each other. Uh, and it's so important that we have these small groups to spend time. Uh, Gail and I were traveling on dairy uh, one night this week, and we looked out under the trees, and we saw two groups meeting two of our small groups meeting. Um, they were separated, you know, a little bit, but they were meeting together. They realized the value of meeting together, the fellowship that God has for us. And then notice he says we need to admit sin. Verse 8, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say we have no sin, we've not sinned. We make him a liar, <clears throat> and his word is not in us. So to admit that we are sinners, to admit and we've been wearing masks at times to admit that we've not been as genuine as we should be. And then as we confess our sin, confess and forsake it to God's bar of soap, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess it. Admit it. Call it what God calls it. And, uh, and God will forgive and accept his forgiveness. Sometimes the hardest people to forgive ourselves. But we should not doubt God's word. God said, I will forgive if you confess. Accept his forgiveness and move on. And uh, there's one of the most frightening verses in the Bible, 1 Peter 4, 17, the first part of it, says, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And I want to say to us today, <clears throat> you know, th this is not an easy message to preach. It's not easy for me to admit it in my own life that there have been times when I have been the hypocrite. But to realize that judgment, as God began judgment on Ananias and Sapphira, God wants to cleanse us of anything that is not genuine and true and life-giving in our life. And he wants to replace it with his forgiveness and uh, his love for us as we move on. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that you are a God of grace and God of forgiveness. That, Father, when we have sinned, that you freely want to forgive us and cleanse us and move us from that hypocrisy to righteousness and genuineness. And I pray, Lord, that we would take that step of faith today, that we would admit, Lord, our need for you, our desire for you to have us holy completely and to clean our act with you. And Father, I pray that uh, you would take our hearts and lives today and uh, remove the mask, Lord, that we would openly admit where we have failed you, where we have come short of what you want for our life, and Lord, that we might totally commit ourselves to you today. And that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together a hymn of invitation, and this is an opportunity, some of you maybe, just to come and pray. Lord, I want to be genuine. Lord, I want to take off my mask. As God speaks to you, this is your opportunity. Maybe to come and Give your heart and life to Christ. Say, I've been living with a mask all my life. I want to be real with God. I want to come confessing my need for him. Our pastor will be standing here in the front. Some of our other pastors on the side. As God speaks, as we stand together, would you come and make that decision?
powerful uh, word from the Lord. Thank you, Brother Larry, for sharing that uh, story. That's one of those stories in the Bible. When you read that, you, you can't forget uh, that story. And I believe the Lord wants us to, to have it uh, just go deeply into our hearts, that He is holy, that He is righteous, uh, that He wants us to live uh, before Him in purity and holiness, to come to Him to confess any hypocrisy that is in our life, that He reveals uh, to, to uh, us, and, and to have that forgiveness that comes from Him when we're faithful to forgive confess our sins before him. And so thank you for that word, brother, for being with us today. And just want to share a couple of announcements before we go. Uh, tonight is the last um, Sunday night food distribution that we'll be doing. We announced that last week as we've just seen the number of cars decrease each week uh, here as the need uh, seems to have lessened here in our community. Uh, but Pastor Doug has uh, just shared with me that uh, we believe we're going to hand out tonight all, basically all of the food that we have, we believe will go out tonight, which means we won't have really anything left in our on ongoing ministry of our food pantry. We still believe we're going to have folks come throughout the week to our church in need of food, and so I uh, would just ask that you would uh, just continue to bring some food by the church. Anytime the office is open, uh, you can bring that. It'll just help us to be able to restock that pantry, and uh, as we believe that ministry will be ongoing uh, in, in the weeks to come. Uh, also a reminder, uh, we're in this uh, season where we're just asking you to prayerfully uh, consider any uh, men in our church that you know that fit the biblical qualifications of, of a deacon, and uh, you can submit those uh, to uh, fbcmail.info. There's a form there you could send in uh, for that. We appreciate your help with that. Uh, also, there's an opportunity to give to the Lord to worship through giving uh, as you go today if the Lord leads you to. And then uh, also as we just continue to uh, try to sanitize uh, the building between our services during this season, uh, we just ask if you would just fellowship with one another right outside uh, of uh, the building today to give us some time and space to be able to get ready for our last service at 1130 today. And I love you, church family. Have a wonderful week this week on mission with King Jesus. All right. One more, brother. One more. You tired? <laughs>